Hello, and welcome to the Physique Development Podcast. And in today's episode, we are going to be talking about the greatest legal performance-enhancing drug that you're likely neglecting. But before we get into all of that, Alex, how was your week? <laughs> it was uh, it was good. So we're coming off of Christmas, mm -hmm. and uh, we had some great celebrations um, with Sue's family, mm -hmm. which was fantastic. And so it was nice to have a few days. We had the, the week off of check-ins, which was really nice. And... Uh, enjoyed our weekend, had some presents that we were looking forward to that we mm -hmm. received, which we are super grateful for. There's a pair of shoes that I was tremendously excited about. <laughs> to say that, the fuck I'm <laughs> That I was tremendously excited about and Sue's parents got them for me. And so I am lit about that. <laughs> um, but how was your weekend? It was good. Uh, Christmas was incredible. It was honestly something that we have kind of alluded to or we haven't really mentioned on this podcast is that this year, um, and we can go more in depth at a future episode, but my dad got diagnosed with cancer and it's something we haven't really talked about publicly. When it happened, we really only addressed the people that it was going to affect. So we talked to all of our clients and we touched base with the staff on physique development. Um, but it's just been something that we've been wanting to be able to process on our own, as well as being able to be present in the way that we need to within our work, as well as within the family. And so it has been just such a blessing that we live so close to my parents. We live only five minutes away um, from a drive from my parents, which has been incredible for us to be able to be near them and to be helping out. And I'm so, so thankful that Columbus has a really incredible cancer hospital of the Jane names. And so he's been getting some really great help. And honestly, I might allude back to this when it comes to this episode and what we're going to be talking about. Uh, but within everything going on, it's been it's been a journey. <laughs> there's There's been a lot of emotions. And at the beginning of this month of December, things weren't looking too, too hot. Um, it was just that we we're trying to get chemo started and trying to get him in a better spot. And he was not acting himself, rightfully so, within everything that was going on. And Christmas Eve and Christmas Day were just like a breath of fresh air because he is acting very much himself, <laughs> giving us grief, giving us a hard time, joking around. He's really mobile um, with as long as he has like his walker with him. Um, he has been very self-sufficient uh, and he's had his appetite back, which has been incredible because before all of this, um, my dad and my mom both embarked on like their fitness journey and um, that we were able to help them and talk them through and both of them lost around 15 to 20 pounds. And I was so extremely proud of them. They're gonna be our poster child for marketing. Uh, and then um, with him getting sick and losing his appetite, appetite and a few other factors, he's lost a good chunk of weight and struggled to keep weight on. And so he was eating normally on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And it just was like so wonderful outside of the presents, which of course I love, but outside of the presents and everything else that comes with the holiday, it was just like my dad is back and my dad is is feeling good. And so that was the the biggest gift or the best gift that I could have gotten within that moment. So I had a really special um, holiday and it was just great to be able to see us grow together as a family. Um, and Alex has obviously been a part of my family um, and my immediate family for a while now, but just more and more he's in the fold and he's siblings with my siblings and um, he tries to rank himself in the favorite child order <laughs> within not, my parents. It's not really, I'm, you know, I'm not the one pushing the envelope on that. <laughs> I would say that your parents are more so just continuing to move me up the ranks uh -huh. and surpass each of you as I continue to make my way to the top. Yes. Um, it's not been an easy journey. You oh know, I've, I've been working very hard to continue to earn my right to pass each of you along the way. Um, but you know. he's definitely working there because anytime I go and see my parents are like, where's Alex? And I'm like, <laughs> so sorry that I am not enough for you right this second. But Alex is not here. I'm sorry to disappoint. Well, as we can both agree that uh, one of us is great, but both of us together is, is yes, better anyway. Yes, so. we do. Yeah. We do agree to that. Uh, well, getting into this episode and what that legal performance enhancing drug is, sleep. 
And sleep is so freaking important, and it's for the elite. I know a lot of times people think like, I got to be grinding 24-7, sleep is for the week, and I am going to have no days off and nose to the grindstone. But actually, sleep isn't for the week. It is for the elite, and it is going to be such an incredible thing that you need in place for you to have a high quality of life, as well as to accomplish your physique goals and your career goals and aspirations. And there are so many things that sleep affects, which we're going to get into here in a second. But sleep is for the elite. Right. And we will get into this as the episode continues. But I am a um, poster child for doing this extremely wrong way for a long time. Um, I was a poster child for hustle culture and um, sleep when you're dead type mentality Mm -hmm. for a long time. And over the last few years, it's really caught up to me. Uh, (laughs) My body does not respond the same way that it once did uh, to the lack of sleep and the hustle and bustle and just you know, being up and at him and sleeping only two to four hours a night for months on end. That was my life for a, a good while there. And uh, yeah, so this is going to stem or a lot of the things that we're going to speak on obviously are going to be backed by research, but also through experience through um, our own, as well as what we've worked on with clients and some of the things that they've had to navigate through. So I'm excited for us to dig in. Yeah, and we'll have any research articles linked in the description for things that we talk about. We're not going to be citing specific research a ton in this, but we will have backing up the things that we are talking about in the show notes or in the description below. So you can definitely check those out. Uh, So going into things here, humans aren't meant to be sleep deprived, and that shouldn't come as a surprise to you that we do need sleep to be able to function. And again, it plays such a crucial role in your success in life, and not just talking about financial success or career success, but your ability to be a quality human being. And that's something that we'll also talk about a little bit more about how Alex and I act when we don't get enough sleep and how much it does impact our day-to-day and how how we are joyful to be around or enjoyable to be around. Um, So when I go ahead and talk about what sleep affects, I am going to look down to make sure I hit every single thing, but it is going to aid in muscle recovery, repair, and growth. It regulates hormones like leptin, ghrelin, growth hormone, testosterone, insulin, and more. It is going to be a regulator of metabolism and your appetite, as well as it's going to strengthen your immune system, which we've also talked about being sick and And, you know, sleep is going to be really helpful in being able to strengthen that immune system. It's going to reduce mood changes, reduce stress, and reduce anger. It's going to increase balance and coordination, have a positive impact on blood sugar, blood pressure, and inflammation. It's going to allow your digestive system to function properly. It's going to have a positive impact on your mental ability and emotional state. It's going to help with fat loss, and it's going to aid in your ability to concentrate, learn, learn new things, be creative, and more. So obviously, I touched on a lot of processes in the body that sleep affects, and there are more that it does affect. So within having that list in mind, what kind of comes to mind for you when you're you're hearing all of these things, but also knowing, hey, I don't always prioritize my sleep? The few things that come to my mind are... Um potentially like from a client standpoint, finding themselves in a situation where they're not happy with their results mm-hmm. and are just looking at the the things that are not biofeedback related and, and that being sleep. So they're just focusing on hitting their food, getting their training done, not really focusing on how well they're recovering. They're just like, I'm checking all of these main boxes. Why am I not seeing the results? And then you're able to uh, work in stress mitigation tactics as well as improving overall sleep habits. And then all of a sudden, things start to get into alignment. They start to feel a whole hell of a lot better um, and see the results that they wanted Mm -hmm. to at a pretty expedited rate. Like sleep in and of itself can can really let things uh, flow much faster for you. Um, And so that's the the big rock. For myself, one of the things that I, that come to my mind as you 
go through the laundry list that's not even all inclusive to what it is helping with is my mood and my ability to um, best perform within my my work. Um, my mood is probably the thing that gets uh, immediately hit. I'm, I'm just a little bit more easily <laughs> irritable uh, in those time frames for the, the first day where I have poor sleep the night before. I'm a little bit more irritable. The second day, if I if I compound that, mm-hmm. um, I try to overcompensate the day prior, and then I try to and then I try to go in again, have poor sleep. Then I'm just like, just don't talk to me today. Like I'm just I need to get through today, and then I'm going to sleep. Um, so the mood aspect is big, and then just the ability to perform and uh, navigate through all the different things that my personal clients have going on. It's a, it's a lot of mm-hmm. emotion and energy to take on. And if you're coming from a place of like a, a half full cup, if you will, or an empty cup, my ability to provide um, guidance and and insight in terms of what needs to happen next or why things are happening is lessened. And I don't want to provide a service that is any lesser than my best. And so sleep is a massive priority. Yeah. And I think for myself, one of the first thing that changes is going to be my mood and or my digestion, or I should say, appetite. yeah, my, my digestion, like hugely. I mean, I've talked about it, about how I struggle with and having a sensitive digestive system and having IBS. And sleep is something that I can very much control most of the time. And so being able to really hammer down on that is going to determine, again, not only my appetite and lack of sleep can either cause you to have a higher appetite or a lower appetite. It is going to depend on the person and the circumstance, but it can completely change my appetite and just make my digestion run so wonky. What I think of like the most clear in my head is thinking about like travel days. And if you have an early travel day and you've eaten your food, like close to going to bed, you're going to bed late and you're waking up early of like how awful your digestion is like that whole day when you're trying to get things done. Um, as well as just like, again, my my mood and my response of I am going to be a little bit more short tempered um, and I'm just going to be a little bit more emotional as a whole. That's what I noticed for myself. And being able to go through that list that I just talked and talk about what happens when you don't get sleep. So you're not just having that positive reinforcement of, oh, if I sleep, this happens. Because if you don't sleep, the opposite really does happen. So thinking you are lessening your immune system, you are lessening your coordination, you are lessening your mental ability and your emotional state, you are cutting back on your ability to lose fat and to gain muscle, and you are like shooting yourself in the foot. And sleep and stress are two things that I can see clients nailing and checking every box like you talked about. And they are killing it in every box. But if their stress or sleep is unmanaged or not prioritized, they are just constantly shooting themselves in the foot. And like you said, not seeing the progress that they want to see. So if you're listening to this or watching this and you're thinking like, I've tried everything and I just am not seeing the results I want to try. I hit my macros. I get my training session in. Like, are you freaking sleeping or are you managing your stress? Because those can cause everything to go off kilter. Right. I think that sometimes individuals, when they're taking these, uh, their fitness journey on by themselves, they can track their food, they can do their training and then they're, they don't see the results that they want. And then they're like, "Ah, it's just not meant for me. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not meant to be in shape. I'm meant to be overweight. I'm meant to look this way, what have you. And it's more so getting into the nitty gritty of of looking at your sleep, looking at hormonal function, all these things are going to be impacted and outside of just the the big rocks that are there. And so if you're, if you're listening to this and you feel as though it's like, I've tried, I've tried to venture and, and make my body composition better. And I've, I've tried to venture down my fitness journey and it's just not meant for me understand that there are many other things that we need to look at and that your improved body composition, the the physique that you're desiring or how you want to look is certainly possible. It's just a matter of understanding the pieces that go into making that a reality. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's a huge reason why having a coach is so helpful. And I even had this come up in a check-in where a client just traveled and then it's just been the holidays and she's in a dieting phase. And so it could have been her mindset of, I need to jump back into everything and go full 
throttle. But in her check-in, she was like, I looked at everything and I was actually filling out this check-in sheet and realized that I needed to rest before I could get in there and train. And so she really focused on sleep for three days. And she was like, I got nine hours of sleep for three days straight. I rested. I still got steps in. I focused on food. And then she went into training and hit some PRs. And it's just the aspect. And it's often so overlooked of if you are nailing down everything, it's like, ah, sleep. I didn't get all the hours, but I'm, I'm nailing down every variable. But I can't state enough how important of a variable sleep is. And it's not one that should just be brushed off of like, eh, I only got like three or four hours or I didn't get quality sleep, even though I was asleep for seven or eight hours. Um, that shouldn't affect me too much. It, it is going to affect you largely. Um, so we want to offer a solution because being able to talk about all of the problems or the information, everyone knows you are for the most part knows you should get more sleep, but we want to talk about the best ways to improve sleep. So this did start off with a question that came to us from Instagram of just what are your best tips on improving sleep? And so we're going to cover seven different factors or ways that can really make or break your sleep. So each of them are going to have their own impact, but all together they can change your sleep quality and quantity. So I'm excited to be able to go over this. So um, what those seven are, and you can kind of keep them in mind as we go through them, routine, a wind down time before bed, caffeine, environment, your darkness and light exposure, your training and nutrition, and supplements. So we're going to dive into each of these and talk about how they affect sleep, as well as what you can do to get the best sleep and really improve your sleep as a whole. And as Alex mentioned in the beginning of talking about our own woes with it and not to use it of, oh, it, this worked for me or this happened to me, but just being able to show you that nobody's perfect in this. And this is all about improving. And we're going to talk about how recently we have been slacking a little bit on sleep and our routine and how we get back into it and really the things that we focus on. And these seven things are the things that we personally focus on. We push forward within our clients. There's research supporting it. And so we wanted to be able to present the information to you guys. So going into number one, which is routine. So this means keeping the same wake and sleep time. So this would be uh, regularly waking up at, let's say, 6 a.m. and regularly going to sleep at 10 p.m. and not having this huge variance of, okay, I just wake up really at any time in the morning and go to sleep at any time in the evening. And you don't need to be perfect with this. Again, we're not perfect with this. But being able to keep that in a 15 to 30-minute time window, if possible, is going to help with your circadian rhythm, and it's going to help allowing the proper rise and fall of stress hormones. So you've probably heard about cortisol, and it's a stress hormone, and stress is bad, but we actually do want to see cortisol high in the morning. We want to see it rise up, and then throughout the day, it's going to go down. And so we want to make sure that we have that proper rise and fall of stress hormones, which is going to be linked to your circadian rhythm, and being able to have those proper natural melatonin levels as we move into the evening. Um, so routine is going to be largely, largely important here. And within routine, this is something that Alex and I actually had to like sit down together and be able to talk through of what was going to work best for us and how we felt the best when it came to our, our schedule and our sleep. Yeah. And I think that within that routine, being able to have it, because I think that kind of like the, the routine, the wind down time, um, like everything is, is kind of coexisting. So the, the, the routine is the, um, the big circle and then everything kind of feeds into that, if you will. And so within the routine, it, it's something where with, with clients that I, and working with, I will encourage them to try and stay on, especially the the waking mm -hmm. um, portion of things. And so if they do stay out a little bit later, unfortunately, they're just going to miss out a, on a little bit of sleep that next day. Because oftentimes what happens is that if you stay out later, let's say that you generally go to bed at 10 and then you're out until uh, midnight the next day, and then you push back your uh, waking schedule by two hours, that oftentimes just continues to be the case. And then you're kind of falling behind, behind the eight ball. And so it's better to be waking up at the same time and then get right back on schedule the next day. Cause it's very difficult if you have another extra two hours of sleep, because what's happening is a, a hormone called adenosine is building up throughout the day. When we wake, it is going to be the lowest. And when we're trying to go to bed, it should be at its highest for the day. Caffeine's going to play a role in this. And we'll talk about that. 
And so with a adenosine itself, what we're going to run into is that that um, secretion or buildup, because it's just compounding over the day, is going to just stay in that same schedule and it's going to align with the circadian rhythm as a whole. And so we want to be cognizant of that and try to get back into rhythm as soon as we possibly can. Yeah. And I think that this goes in like being able to see the context of it, of if you can have flexibility and push back just that one day of, hey, I stayed up way too late. So for example, if we stay up watching a football game or something like that, of, hey, I'm going to be not waking up at my normal 5 a.m. I might be waking up at 6 or 7 a.m. And I have a plan for the day. And I realized that it was my, I don't want to say mistake, but it was my doing that I stayed up late. Later, right. I kind of have the consequence of that, and that's either going to be less sleep or more sleep and changing my schedule. And so you obviously don't want to be in a place where you're constantly out late and then you're constantly cutting sleep in the morning and just thinking, well, I should get right back on routine because you, you do need sleep. But being able to look at that contextually is going to be so, so helpful to know when I should just realize I'm going to get a little bit less sleep tonight and when I should prioritize, hey, I should probably sleep in a little bit today because I am not getting adequate sleep throughout the evening. Right. Yeah, and that's something that our routine gets thrown off. Um, it's something called procrastination bedtime revenge. And we realized this in 2020, and we were working crazy hours and overstimulating ourselves with caffeine of having like a cold brew, like with an extra shot, like a venti cold brew, while also having other stimulants throughout the day and working from like 5 or 6 a.m. until 10 p.m. at night and just going full force. And then we would realize, hey, we haven't really gotten time for our ourselves today. We want to spend time together. We want to have time for ourselves. We want to enjoy the day, but the day was over. And we ended up staying up until like 1 or 2 a.m., quite often, and then trying to wake up again at 5 a.m. and go after it. And so like Alex stated, having those three or so hours of sleep wasn't really beneficial um, as a whole. And so when I do realize, hey, I've stayed up a little bit later, I am going to have to sleep. I can't wake up at the exact time I wanted to. Um, getting back in routine can be difficult because there is going to be a night you're going to have to cut short on sleep. But I think that, again, looking at context is really helpful of saying, all right, if I take the hit today, I'm going to be back on schedule and be back in routine. And we sometimes have to call each other out or hold each other accountable within this of like, we've been staying up too late. Like I'm getting to bed at this time and like I need to flip the script on this. Um, and we use that for accountability for each other as well as just to have those conversations of we know we do best when we wake up early in the morning. And so going to sleep too late, although we can do it every once in a while or on the weekends, really does impact our flow and our schedule. And so we want to keep that routine of that early wake up. Cool. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. Yeah. So going into winding down before bed, I know that wind down routines and a morning routine and an evening routine. Um, I know Alex has feelings on how long that those should be and what those look like. And I have great news for you. This doesn't have to be a three hour self care extravaganza. Um, and when we look at a wind down routine, um, this is going to be extremely helpful when it comes to falling asleep. So if you struggle with falling asleep, and we'll make some different mentions here if you have times where you wake up throughout the evening. But it, the biggest challenge going to bed can often be when you're trying to fall asleep and you're not tired when you lay down. And so an easy way to help this is to get in the habit of winding down and having that bedtime routine as you get into the evening. And so being able to do something peaceful and relaxing um, and hopefully away from screens if you can. It's not the end of the world if you're using screens, but reading a book, going for a walk in the evening, having some time with your significant other or with your family and being able just to have that as that um, 
not trigger, but that signal for you of like, hey, it's it's bedtime. I need to be able to go to sleep. And so if you are watching TV, just being aware of the brightness of your TV screen. And oftentimes with TV screens, you can put on like the blue light bro- blocker on it, which can be really helpful because we've all heard that blue light before bed can be really hard for us. Um, but Alex, what does your bedtime routine really look like? I actually have the greatest bedtime routine possible. This is going to be for all of my THC consumers um, because I have the perfect layout and I will share that with you guys today. This is, um, you guys are obviously getting this for free today. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think that honestly, I should charge hundreds of thousands (laughs) of dollars for this because it's going to change your life. If you want to PayPal us a tip or Venmo us, we'll leave those Yeah, after your first (laughs) night of it, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, best night of my sleep. And then you're going to go a month. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm the best version of me. I'm the most jacked and leanest version (laughs) of myself as well. And so then at that point, you can uh, Venmo me. So listen up. This is what I've got. <laughs> so you're going to have your final meal at like, let's say you're going to bed at seven or I'm sorry, <laughs> not seven. You're going to bed at 10. You're going to bed at 10 PM. Your final meal is at seven. You're going to enjoy a delicious carb dense meal. That is fantastic. You're going to go outside now. You well, I don't, you don't have to smoke a joint. Mm-hmm. I would encourage smoking a joint or have a nice edible mm-hmm. at the, at the conclusion of, of your THC consumption, go and take a very warm shower, mm-hmm. a, a long, warm shower, clean. Like we all know that when you shower, there's, there's two, maybe three different types of showers where yeah. you're just kind of like you're rinsing off and then you, like your everyday shower where you're cleaning yourself, but it's not like a deep clean. Mm-hmm. And then you've got a deep clean. Mm-hmm. And so and what then I, you have a fourth one of just standing in the hot water. That's that, my shower. That one doesn't exist for me, but that does exist for <laughs> Sue. So you go in, you have a deep clean shower, really clean yourself off, real hot water, come out do a little bit of static stretching, get into a yoga flow of sorts. That's 20, 30 minutes there. At that point, you're going to feel extremely sleepy and extremely, Mm -hmm. extremely relaxed. From there, you're going to have your room temperature. We're going to talk about this between 65 and 68 degrees. It's going to be icy. So you're going to take yourself after your yoga and your, your static stretching, get under the covers, get all cozy, pull out a book, start reading for a little bit, you're going to get about five to six pages into this book. And all of a sudden, you're going to be (sighs) dead asleep. You ain't going to wake up till the morning, knocked out. (laughs) And so now take that, utilize that tonight. If you're you're not a THC consumer, skip the THC part and just enjoy your evening and and have uh, great sleep without it. And you'll be fantastic. Yes. And uh, there's also research talking about how cold exposure is really helpful in the morning and having more heat exposure is really helpful in the evening. So those showers that Alex talked about, not only are they really enjoyable, especially if you know you did just enjoy a little bit of a J, um, but there's actual scientific proof of having that warm shower and especially in the evening can be really helpful with having you go to bed. And another thing I wanted to talk about when it comes to THC use, and if you use CBD, that's another thing that you can have in place. And if you are using THC, being able to bias an indica strain or being able to have an edible or a strain that has CBN in it, and that's going to be really helpful when it comes to sleep. But one thing I wanted to mention about that and with Alex mentioning just smoking a joint is that's a big part of our wind down routine and our time together is being able to be present without screens most of the time and just sit and talk to one another. And so it's really relaxing because you can get so caught up in the hustle and bustle of everything and you can get pretty consumed by screens and by everything that's going on and all the stuff we have access to, all the people we have access to on a daily basis. But having that time to to really slow down and chill out is extremely important to us. So it's not just the act of, oh, I got THC in my system. It's the act of us sitting there and hanging out and being able to wind down, which I think is a big part of our wind down routine as a whole. Yeah. I think that the biggest thing is just like for individuals who live by themselves, it's so easy to put yourself in a situation where the wind down is watching movies and then scrolling TikTok, Instagram, what have you. And you're just elongating the time frame in which you probably should have been asleep already, but you're just kind of like bored and wanting to do something. And so oftentimes the the boredness leads you into losing like an hour or two of sleep. Mm-hmm. And then potentially once you actually close your eyes and start to fall asleep, the quality of that front end is not really good mm-hmm. anyway. So you're 
you're missing out on potentially three or four hours of sleep. And so being able to really, um, I don't, I don't want to say isolate yourself, but remove the, the screen exposure and those different factors um, and allow for yourself to get into a book and, and do things that are more relaxing and, and um, as a whole is going to be tremendously advantageous for your productivity the next day as well as just the quality of your sleep, of course. Yeah, and be okay being bored. If you are bored, then go to sleep and get some good quality sleep. Wake up early the next morning and you get the frick after it. Um, and within us talking about screens and what you're watching, that's something that we're very cautious of, of how much intensity is happening within the show. So if we are watching something, we try to not make it something that's like a scary movie or something that's going to be an action movie or really intense or even a new show that we're watching that we're going to want to pay attention to and stay in tuned with. And so what we'll often do is being able to put on a show we've watched hundreds of times like The Office and enjoy it, but know we could fall asleep at any time and we're not going to miss out on anything. We're not going to try and stay up to watch it. Um, but being able to have things that are a little bit more calming to watch are really helpful. And that's where we get, um, we miss out on a lot of TV shows because people will recommend them to us. We're like, that's a little bit too intense before bed. So we're likely not going to be watching that unless we watch it midday on a Sunday. <laughs> um, but for my wind down routine, I mean, it's having that time with Alex, but then it's also just a few things that signal to me of, hey, I'm getting ready to bed, which is going to be like washing my face and putting lotion on my body and my face and being able to do what other skincare I want to do and then doing some of those stretches like Alex mentioned um, and just being able to have some time to myself as a whole. So being able to figure out what that means to you, again, doesn't need to be a 16-hour self-care routine. It's just a few things that, again, are going to be that signal to you of I'm going to bed, and that's going to help get your brain and yourself prepared for bed as you wind down as a whole. So caffeine, Alex's... Um, you know, biggest growth in all, over the past few years, I think, has been within your relationship and your use of caffeine. Yeah. Um, growing up, I was able to use caffeine pretty simply. I, I, I was there's a there's a demographic of individuals who are able to consume caffeine and go to bed. There's a mutation to the receptor that allows for them to do that. I think I was part of that group for a large period of my life. As of the last couple of years, whether that be like, I don't know, whether it be like stress mitigation, age, whatever it is, um, I'm just not able to do that anymore. The mutation has left me. I am back to a uh, normal humans receptors within uh, caffeine and those different aspects. And so caffeine in and of itself, one of the things that I follow, and I, I follow it a little bit more extreme than what I would say is like provided through literature, um, but I track either eight to 10 hours from when I'm planning to go to bed. And that is the absolute last time that I will have caffeine. I normally cut off caffeine consumption by noon, more often than not. Honestly, my only caffeine for the last couple of, of weeks has been uh, my first, my only cup of coffee, um, which is right around 5.30 in the morning. And then I have no uh, other caffeine throughout the day. And my sleep has tremendously benefited from that. Um, but caffeine is a tough one because what happens is that, let's say you have one night of, of poor sleep, you try to overcompensate that second day and then you're having uh, you're having coffee um, or, or energy drinks or what have you into the late afternoon and then that's causing you to have another poor night of sleep. And so it's one of those things that steamrolls over time and it can happen so quickly over a span of just two or three days that it gets really bad. And so, um, just being cognizant of of this tool, and it's a great tool, and I'm not here to demonize caffeine whatsoever. I'm a huge proponent, mm -hmm. um, but I think that you just have to be cognizant of how it's affecting your sleep and how it's affecting you and the sensitivity that you have. Yeah, and that's something where, again, earlier in our relationship, we were both caffeine fiends, and we were consuming a ton of it later in the day, too, and like I I say to a certain degree of not feeling the effects of it, but I think we were just masking it so much or just weren't as in tune or whatever it may be. But like Alex said, we're pro-caffeine. I'm all about it. Team Nespresso, love me some Nespresso. And caffeine can, I mean, increase your um, alertness, your attention, your vigilance, your reaction time. It's a, a really big positive. But too much caffeine, um, just overall, not even talking about the frame close to bed, is going to cause restlessness, shaking anxiety, upset stomach, insomnia, and headaches. And so obviously none of us want any of those things. And so when we look at 
caffeine in and of itself, what the literature shows is it is going to depend on how much, how often, and how sensitive you are to caffeine. But in general, you want to avoid caffeine and stimulants four to nine hours before bed. Because when we look at caffeine, when you consume it, it takes about 45 minutes to like really hit you and really reach its peak when it comes to the caffeine. And so just a little a side asterisk, if you're taking your pre-workout, like as you're walking into the gym, that caffeine really ain't hitting you until closer to the end. Um, but when you are looking at that, it also is going to stay in your bloodstream for about eight to nine hours afterwards. And so if you are having to, let's say you train after work or you have to train later in the evening and you want to have pre-workout in place, we've mainly switched to a non-stem pre-workout. So non-stem just means it doesn't have caffeine. So it's just still gonna have a lot of the other effects of a pre-workout that's going to help you, whether it's within blood flow or focus or any of those aspects, but it's not gonna have that caffeine and that stimulation from that caffeine. But we also know that people have different jobs and different routines, and maybe you work night shift, or maybe, again, the only time you have to train is in the evening, and you do need that bump, or you end up having caffeine, whatever it may be. We're going to talk about this more in supplements, but there is going to be a supplement um, called rutocarpine that is going to help remove the caffeine from your bloodstream if you do have it too not, close. Not to remove. It. Well, help, sorry. Help metabolize. Help metabolize. <laughs> I apologize with that phrasing. Yeah. It's going to help metabolize metabolize the caffeine. It's not just like these magic hands that go in and take it out. Um, thank you for that clarification. But um, with that, one thing I wanted to touch on is decaf coffee. I'm freaking team decaf. And I thought that as a coffee lover, because I've been a coffee lover for a while, that it was like death over decaf and decaf is for losers. And that's like the vibe I got from coffee lovers. And then I started to have decaf and I was like, this shit ain't half bad. And again, the Nespresso decaf, the Melo's, what I, I don't know how to pronounce it, that one bangs. And so I actually start my day with decaf and then I'll have caffeine a little bit later in the morning. And then if I want more coffee, then I'll have decaf again. And it's just been a way that I can enjoy coffee and the routine of coffee without feeling like I'm overstimulating myself or just dumping caffeine into my system when I might not even need it, which I think a lot of people get into the habit too of just having it because it's part of, you know, how people, you know, live their life. Yep. So environment, you mentioned this earlier and being able to go into what it looks like for temperature, but what are some other things that people should keep in mind when it comes to their sleep environment and the room that they're sleeping in? Uh, so many things. I, I think that this is, is huge. I'm also just a big, uh, person on environment as a whole scent, cleanliness, um, temperature, all those things matter to me all the time. And so for, for me, the first thing is, is keeping the room tremendously clean, your sheets, your, your pillowcase, um, your covers, all those things clean, your floor, very clean. If you are someone who is is sleeping in a pigsty that is affecting your sleep, whether you want to believe that or not, it is, it is causing distraction and, um, taking up mental space. I, I firmly believe that. And I then, can confirm of past Sue that that is the case. Yes. S Sue and Alex sharing a bedroom. That's never been the case. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so, uh, that is the, the number one thing temperature wise, this is going to play a large role as well. It needs to be cold. It needs to be, um, very dark, uh, as well. So making sure that maybe you have some, some blackout blinds or, um, just keeping the room dark, try not to have a TV on, or if you need something like a, a, a very dim nightlight or something along those lines as you make your way to the bathroom or something along those uh, lines as a whole. Um, but environment is, is huge. Utilizing things like um, essential oils can be great as well. Lavender, uh, things that are going to, to be more restful or, or calming will be uh, extremely advantageous. So environment plays a, a big role. Yeah. So when it comes to that temperature, that 60 to 68 degrees is going to be the agreed upon temperature. And within literature, that's going to be the great range for getting restful quality sleep. And so you might feel a little backwards of you just said that there's research that shows having that warmness before bed is helpful, but it's really talking about your personal temperature of warming up and then being able to be cozy going into bedtime. Um, because also when you wake up, your body is going to warm up to wake you up 
up, but it needs to be cool to be able to have sleep and restful and quality sleep. So if you don't have a fan, a fan could also be really helpful, not only for the noise aspect, but also just to have airflow. Um, We don't have a ceiling fan, so we do have like a fan on the floor and we use it every single night and it helps us a ton when it comes to that airflow even though we also have it turned down to 68 degrees and then also white noise which I talked about this in my gift video of we have a travel white noise machine and it is really really helpful as well as we have like a travel humidifier but a humidifier is another thing in general that can be really helpful again whether it's the sound or just keeping your space um, and keeping the quality of the air in the best spot. And especially if you live in a cold area um, and if you feel like your skin is really dry and you're dealing with that, having that humidifier at night can be so extremely helpful. Um, But also having a good and high quality mattress and pillow. I have gone over this with clients time and time again, where if they're asking about what supplement they need to purchase or if they want to get gym attachments or gym equipment, and I know that their sleep is an issue, I'm like, hey, let's put money towards a good quality mattress because this is about to change your life. And it really does. I mean, we've all slept on a shitty hotel mattress and been like, I just had the worst night of sleep of my life. And that can happen time and time again. So if you have a mattress that's 10 plus years old um, and you are having crappy nights of sleep or you feel like you're waking up and aching, please, please, please look at investing in a high quality mattress and or pillow. If you need a pillow recommendation, Sage Sleep is the brand, and we love it. It's incredible. Um, But get a good quality mattress and pillow and go and test them out. That's how we found our mattress is going and laying on a bunch of mattresses and also knowing our own likes of firmness and all that jazz. But having a good quality mattress and pillow is going to be absolutely huge. Um, And another thing I want to mention, because a lot of you guys know that we have two crazy incredible dogs, um, but they're also very big, is to keep pets out of the bed. Now, I get it. I know that this is difficult, and I've had lots of conversations of people just wanting to cuddle their pets and loving them, and I feel you very hard on that. And Gus and I used to share a bed before Alex came into the picture, Um, and when Alex came into the picture, a queen bed really didn't fit three humans, So, because Gus and Tucker are both human-sized. And so we kicked Gus out of the bed and it improved our sleep. And when we got Tucker, he is a little weasel and he got us back into letting him sleep in the bed. Not we. (laughs) Me. And he, it was causing me to have awful sleep because he was laying in my space. He was moving. He would lay on top of me and my body would go numb because he's a heavy boy Um, or just his dander. And Alex is actually allergic to dogs. So with him talking about like the sheets being clean, that's also going to help if you struggle with acne Like, if you don't frequently wash your sheets, I would highly recommend looking into that. Of We try to have our sheets cleaned once a week, and that is so helpful for our quality of sleep. And who, like, the best feeling is when, like, you're clean, and then you get into, like, clean sheets. So it's just the best feeling, and you're just setting yourself up for success. So having the dogs out of, not, they don't have to be out of the room, but out of the bed and having space for them to be in um, is going to be extremely helpful. So um, again, you could be doing the wind down routine and all of that, but your environment for sleep isn't in the best spot. And so that's where it's going to be really important to hone in on. Um, So talking about darkness and light exposure here, we already mentioned of having those blackout blinds and how important it is to have a dark area and having it as dark as you can get. Because light exposure at night has been shown to inhibit the production of melatonin and lead to interrupted sleep. So again, if you're waking up throughout the night multiple times, it could be due to that light exposure. So having blackout blinds is going to be helpful or even using like a um, eye mask could be helpful if you can't have blackout binds or it's just not dark enough still. Um, But I also wanted to make a note when we're talking about darkness and light exposure, what it looks like for natural light exposure. So it's extremely important to get natural light exposure to help with your circadian rhythm. And exposure to natural light in the morning and in the evening is our body's most fundamental time reference anchor. And so our circadian rhythms, which affect our sleep cycles, those are set according to exposure 
to light. So especially with this being the winter time, the days being shorter, it being darker in the morning and darker in the evening sooner, you might realize sleep is getting pretty difficult for you because it might be pitch black at 4 p.m. and you're thrown off and you have no idea what's going on. Um, so being able to get that exposure to light is going to be so important. And using the term of sunlight before screen light, if possible. Um, so even if it's cloudy, your mental health and physical health are going to strongly benefit. And if you haven't heard me talk about how beneficial it is to get outside, get walks, get fresh air, get light exposure, I won't bore you again, but just know it is extremely, extremely, extremely important. And how well you slept last night and when you felt sleepy going to bed and how much you felt upon waking are mainly controlled by how early and how much sunlight you viewed before 10 a.m. in the preceding two or three days. So these are going to be non-negotiable things of, hey, seeing this light is so important to me, as well as like I talked about with those cortisol levels, viewing morning light sunlight increases morning cortisol levels by 50%, which is a good thing early in the day because it increases your immune function alertness and it sets a timer internally. Again, it's that anchor for you of 14 to 16 later, hours later, I'm going to be going to bed. And so being able to be outside, have that light exposure, even if it's just for a few minutes. This morning, I only had like 10 minutes tops to go on a walk. And I went on a six minute walk and just got outside, got some light and came back in. It wasn't perfect, but it was something. So it is a so extremely important to have darkness when you're sleeping, but have that natural light exposure throughout the day to have quality sleep. This is one of the things that um, yeah, as as uh, coaches ourselves, I, I feel this this need to be perfect within all things. Or I felt that need as mm -hmm. I was I was as I was coming up, and um, the reality is is that we're not perfect, and that's mm -hmm. like that's the the big thing to drive home here. And this is one of the things that I fall short on um, quite a bit, just because in the mornings I love that quiet time. It's it's pitch black, uh, the dogs are still sleeping, uh, Sue's doing whatever she's doing, and I'm able to just be in my office in the pitch black and work for like two to four hours straight. And I love that. It's my most productive time of the day. I prefer to not be bothered at all. And so in that, I struggle to get that morning sunlight um, because if I'm waking up at five, that really allows for me to work until about nine o'clock, which is really where I like to be. And so it does impact my sleep quite abundantly and things that I've done to improve upon on this now with us being in Ohio, it being December when we're recording this, um, the sun's not coming up until mm -hmm. about eight or nine o'clock anyway. And so what I have been doing is that I've still been doing my 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 morning work as I, I normally would. But then as soon as the sun is set to rise, I go ahead and take a step outside and just have uh, some time to, to work through some breathing. It's also nice because it's quite a bit of cold exposure with it being as cold as it is here. And so I'm out there for like, we'll say five to 10 minutes as a whole. And I think that doing that, this is uh, anecdotal and I'm, I'm just speaking from personal experience, but it has improved my ability within sleep. I would say it's multifactorial as we all know, but I do think that it's been a positive contributing component to my sleep having been improved over the past month or so. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're someone like myself who just likes to get up and we talked about the routines and, and I'm uh, someone who is not on the train of, of early morning routines being this three hour excursion of like, I could have been doing stuff that was super productive, but I'm doing all this like side stuff to be productive for some reason. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, if you're like myself and you just like to have a, a, a glass of water, some electrolytes and coffee and get right into work. I'm, you know, I'm working 15 to 30 minutes from the time I woke up more often than not. And I like that. I feel good doing that. Um, if you're like that, then try this out. Kind of what I've been doing as the sun is, is rising, get outside and have that five to 10 minutes and see if it does positively impact your sleep. Or maybe you're like, dude, that doesn't do anything. And that's fine too and try something else. <laughs> yeah, but like, I, I mean, I'm not, as I said, we're, we're not perfect in general, but I'm waking up early before the sun rises. There's not really a way for me to get sunlight before screen light. It's just really not possible unless I don't start work until 8 or 9 a.m., which is not feasible. And so with that, I just try to get outside when it is light outside of, I take the dogs for a walk in the morning and that's really helpful for me and that's normally around 7.30 or 8 
date when the sun's coming up. And then we really try and we've even shifted some of our schedule to get out again before the sun sets. And so we kind of have like the sunset of when it's setting each day and we're like, we got to get outside before this time happens because it is important to us. It does make us feel better and it is just going to affect our health because when we look at like the relationship between like sunlight and natural light, there's going to be a positive relationship between early day sunlight viewing and earlier bedtimes and better sleep and also a later evening. So like between eight and midnight light viewing and delayed and shortened sleep time. So a lot of that doesn't, isn't, um, explained by what time you go to bed, but it's very much so determined by light exposure as a whole. And so realizing that that is going to have an impact on you and getting in fresh air as well is just going to be beneficial. You don't have to do it it, the exact way that the literature shows. Go and do it the way that you can be consistent with it and it fits your routine because that's so much better than just being down on yourself that it doesn't fit your schedule and routine. You just want to make it work for you and that's exactly what we figured out is, hey, some of these things, we we end up following the research to a T and go go team. But sometimes it's just not feasible. And that's that's life. That's realistic. And so being able to be realistic with yourself, but still being proactive about what you want to accomplish and what's going to help you feel your absolute best. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. So going into training and nutrition, too much or too little can really impact your sleep. So Alex, what does that look like within um, overtraining or under eating or um, looking at the types of training that you're doing? What's that all about? Yeah. So within the training and nutrition component of things, you've got, uh, if you're, you know, training is a stress on the body. And so if you're training later into the evening, you have to be very cognizant of your overall output. Um, if I was to be performing a really hard leg session, I would much prefer to do that at 10, 11 AM in the, you know, during the day. And I understand from a a work standpoint, that that's not always feasible for everyone. I honestly would prefer if, if I only had um, before work and then after work, especially with something that's as intensive as training uh, lower body, I probably would do it before work mm-hmm. just because the recovery component that's necessary from that type of training is going to require tremendous sleep. And so if you're doing it later into the evening, that could be impeding on your ability to have that quality sleep, thus not being able to recover from that training session. And if you're someone like a bikini competitor or a wellness competitor, who is potentially training legs three times a week, there is not a single component of your recovery that you can uh, deprioritize. Like every single thing has to be taken into account for you to be able to hit a muscle group, you know, 20 plus or 25 plus sets per week spread over three sessions is very difficult regardless. But if you're going to put yourself in a position where you're not having adequate uh, sleep in those different aspects, you're really putting yourself behind the eight ball and probably putting in more effort than is needed for the results that you're going to reap because of the factors that you're neglecting. And so when we're looking at training, this is a big one. Now, if you're going in for like a arm session, a delt session, it's not going to be as much of a systemic full body stress as a lower body session would be. But if you're going into, let's say deadlift and you're going into squat and doing all these things, it's going to be important that we're not taking that, you know, super close to, to sleep. I don't know the specific, um, range or, or time that you should, uh, complete training prior to bed. I want to say it's, it's a few hours, like uh, two to three hours. Yeah, two to three hours. Um, and so falling into that category is going to be important. And then also looking at at a nutrition, if we're looking at nutrition and, and let's say that we are in a caloric deficit, this is going to be a stress on the body. We are demanding the body to utilize stored body fat as energy and not giving it enough fuel with our intake of, of food. And so this is going to be a little bit of a stress on the body. And this can cause a little bit of issues with sleep if we're not 
you know, being uh, proactive within all of our other biofeedback markers that we're paying attention to and those different factors. And so it's important to pay attention to uh, when you're having that last meal, uh, what's constituting that last meal. I like to encourage athletes to have a little bit, if they, if it's possible, to have a little bit more of a carb dense meal before bed. I think that that will be something that's helpful, uh, upregulating tryptophan and those different aspects um, to be of benefit. Um, so that's kind of my two cents on on training and nutrition. Yeah, and we want to think about what you can recover from. So it's not just about how close it is to bed, which is a very important aspect to talk about. But if you're overtraining, you are going to be stressing out your psychological systems and impacting your sleep, falling asleep and staying asleep. And then if your nutrition isn't properly matched with your training, then the same thing can happen as you put stress on your body and you are not giving yourself proper nutrients for recovery. And so, like I said, if you're over training or under eating, this can drastically impact your sleep. And we see it a lot within under eating. Well, honestly, both when clients come to us, uh, they're just like, I don't understand why my sleep isn't in the best spot. And maybe they're doing everything that we've talked about, but they're over training or under eating. We get that in place and their sleep quality and quantity immediately improves. Um, and then then also, like Alex said, within how close you are to bed. Um, so that's going to actually streamline right into us talking about supplements because there are a few supplements that we recommend to clients when it comes to sleep in general. But also we understand that a lot of our clients do just have to train after work and they are training closer to bed. Um, and so they might need some help within being able to calm down their their body as a whole and get ready for sleep. Um, but before I go into supplements, the other thing I want to mention when it comes to training and nutrition is that sometimes not moving your body enough can really yeah. impact your sleep. And that's something both Alex and I really realized this year. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the things that I struggled with probably the most is that um, when I go – I. I have seasons of this and I, it's, it's one of those things that, and we've talked about this through different podcasts where when you're, when you're battling, uh, demons and you're battling some of the adversity that, that comes throughout your life, there's, um, it's not always going to be that you slayed the dragon entirely. You're going to kind of, you're going to, uh, beat the dragon down, but there's going to be times where that dragon gets a little bit of a, a breath of fresh air and, and is able to come back into your life. And so for, for me, one of the things that, uh, is a detriment to my day to day is that I get glued to my desk, um, where I just get so submerged within my work and I'm sitting there for truly straight, uh, like eight to 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, those type of weeks can happen. And so what happens is that my brain is fried, obviously from the screen exposure, as well as just the output that I am having at that time. But when my, my mind is so fried, my body has not really had much, if any activity, oftentimes when those phases of my life come about, my steps are low, I may be missing training sessions, those different factors. Definitely a week as I'm talking through this, um, it's not a time that I'm proud of. And honestly, I hate, like it gives me a little bit of the hairs uh, mm -hmm. coming up on my back of my neck because I just despise those seasons of my life. And I um, am proud to say that I'm I'm on a route to where I think that it's just getting less and less. And, and hopefully I have none of those seasons yes. in the future. Um, but when my body is in a place where it's just like having all this kind of conserved energy, I just lay in bed and my body is like, bro, we got to do something. But my mind is like, I need to drown in this bed for 10 to 12 hours to like recoup. And so that's, you know, something that I have to be very cognizant of is that I have to get a sweat in or I have to get movement in every single day, no matter how that kind of fits. It can be yoga because yoga, no matter what, every time I go to a class, I'm sweating because <laughs> I'm just like not capable <laughs> yet. Um, yeah. And, uh, or it's just, you know, getting my steps in outside, it's getting my resistance training in and those different factors. And so the more that you, and this is something that for myself that I had to come to the realization of is that I no longer, cause I think that there was a time in my life where I could neglect different aspects and still be okay. Mm -hmm. I no longer have the capabilities of doing that. And thus I have to look at it from a all inclusive perspective to allow for me to have the best version of myself, whether that be from like a internal, external health, um, mental and emotional health, all the different aspects, they need to be prioritized. They need to be uplifted. They need to be on my docket of making sure that I'm doing something daily to improve them. And so I forgot what the original part of this was, but that's 
I think that answers what the question is. Yeah. I mean, that's why I'm very passionate about steps is it's not just some metric that I need to hit to be healthy. It's truly realizing the impact of those steps on my day. And when I don't get away from my computer, I mean, just the other day, I had a day full of meetings and appointments and interviews. And I was at my desk for so many hours straight. And my sister was going to come over and we were going to go do something. And I was like, can we actually just go on a walk and like hang out and do that? And because I hadn't moved enough that day. And that is just such a helpful thing to know about yourself of, again, that light exposure is helpful for me, the fresh air, all of the benefits from the walks itself, but also the benefit of it's going to help my sleep. It's going to make me a more enjoyable person to be around. And so being able to realize, hey, what are these non-negotiables from me? Even when things can't be perfect, what do I still want to focus on and how can I still make that an emphasis? And I remember when we really figured that out for Alex, of like, oh, crap, there's a huge correlation of the days I don't get my steps in versus do and how my sleep is, then it was very, very important for that to be a priority in both of our lives. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so getting into supplements here and some some that can be helpful um, generally, um, whether you have a lot of issues falling asleep and you struggle with that a lot, or maybe you just want to have support and making sure that you do have good nights of sleep here. So we'll start off with some that are going to be really helpful if you are training closer to bed or doing something really stimulating close to bed. And taurine is going to be one of the top ones that I recommend to clients as well as L-theanine. Um, and when it comes to dosages, theanine, it's going to be between 100 and 400 milligrams, and taurine, normally around that 500 milligrams, although it can be higher there um, for some clients. But theanine is actually going to be something that you've likely already consumed. Um, Not only is it something that's produced in your body, but it's going to be in a lot of caffeine-type products. So a lot of pre-workouts now implement theanine in it, and it's going to help with those effects of caffeine, of being able to calm you down. And the great thing about theanine I mean, what? When it's paired with caffeine, it's not necessarily going to be something that's calming you down, but it's going to allow for if you are someone who experiences the jitters and mm-hmm. those different aspects, it's going to allow for that to be alleviated, but also allow for you to be a little bit more focused rather than being kind of like bouncy with the caffeine. Yes, yes. I thank you for those clarifications here. Sometimes my brain connects things before they they speak out um, as a whole, but being able to help with like that anxiousness feeling that you might be experiencing throughout caffeine. Um, But the great thing about theanine is that it is not a sedative. And so it's not that you take it and you're like, I'm so tired, I'm ready to go to bed. But it is going to help you within, again, calming anxiety and being able to um, help with some of those factors that are going to allow you to calm down as a whole. And taurine is going to help with that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Some other supplements that are going to be advantageous. Magnesium is going to be probably the number one for me personally, um, just with it being something that's going to be often depleted for individuals, it's depleted by stress. And so um, going to bed, it's going to help get into a restful state from a cellular health standpoint, it's going to be important for overall function. And so being able to have the supplementation in place allows for you to be in a more restful state as well as allowing for the cell for the cells to be able to recover optimally and have the resources that they need to do so. So I, I generally recommend this to be between 200 and, and uh, like 600 milligrams. Depending on the type, of course, glycinate is going to be one of the um, greater absorption forms as well as not going to act directly on the GI tract. So if you have oxide or citrate, citrate, something along those lines, it's going to work more as a a laxative. You may be able to see like uh, magnesium citrate is going to be a liquid at Walgreens, for example, that people use from a laxative state. And so uh, uh, glycinate is going to have no uh, interaction or impact on the GI tract. And so you're going to have a better experience getting the benefits that you need from a sleep perspective, utilizing a form like glycinate. Yes, magnesium is the bomb, huge fan of it. Another few supplements that we recommend, um, turmeric is gonna be helpful because it's gonna be anti-inflammatory. Fish oil is also gonna fall into that, although we've already talked a lot about fish oil in general. And I wouldn't say like fish oil is 
the best for sleep, like specifically, but it can very much. Yeah, I would just take your fish oil, your turmeric during the day. Yeah. Um, And Cordy's is another great one, especially if you have a really hard time calming down before bed. Um, That's from a company called New Ethics. Alex and I are both big fans of Cordy's personally. Um, And you can use code BUSH on Cordy's from New Ethics. Um, And we already talked about THC, CBD, CBN, and those are all going to be helpful. I did want to go ahead and talk about melatonin because I know that this is something that a lot of people use or just feel like this is what I need to use when it comes to sleep. And melatonin is going to be something your body already produces. And I've talked about it a few times of like the natural melatonin production or how it falls within cortisol. Um, And within melatonin, it is going to be, again, a hormone. And so light inhibits it and darkness promotes it. And that's where those natural rises and falls come within your body. But when we look at anything sold and looking at just any of those supplements, they're going to be a very high concentration, especially in reference to how much your body produces. And so when we look at that, that's also going to interact with other hormones. So not only is it going to be part of a hormone, um, but it's going to interact with other hormones like your testosterone and your estrogen. And your testosterone can largely affect your sleep as well. So it's okay to use melatonin every once in a while. Let's say you have jet lag or you just are having a really hard spurt of needing to be able to sleep. But using it chronically is likely not going to be the best for your own personal melatonin levels, um, as well as your ability to truly sleep with melatonin. Yeah, I think that one of the, and we can probably dig into this in a a later episode, because getting into each of these supplements and and giving the reasons behind that can, it would get lengthy. Um, But with melatonin, one of the things that I utilize within our nurses who are shifting from day shift to night shift is that we have a protocol in place that allows for us to get the circadian rhythm back into sync. And part of that is the melatonin supplementation. It's going to be a little bit stronger than what we would normally advise. But um, generally, you're wanting to supplement and not uh, completely turn off your natural secretion. So you want to utilize like 500 micrograms to a to one milligram is going to be a good place to be I think off the top of my head here and and if you're listening and and can uh, confirm otherwise please share uh, but I think that you can go up to three milligrams is going to be kind of the uh, clinical dosage that from that point and beyond, you're going to run into potential issues of natural secretion. Um, So saying between that 500 micrograms to a milligram is going to be advantageous. And then the one supplement that we haven't talked a ton on is glycine. I think that glycine plays a humongous role um, in overall allowing for your body to get into a restful state. And that one you can supplement a little bit more heavily. So it's going to be one to three grams within the glycine um, to give you a little bit of benefit. And you don't need to use every single one of these. I mm-hmm. think that for for me personally, the glycine, the theanine, um, and the magnesium are the three that I take every single night for sure. Uh, sometimes the, the, the taurine is going to be in the equation, but those would be the main three. And then the rutacarpin, we talked about this briefly. Yeah. Rutacarpin is going to be one from a, a research standpoint that's going to be kind of wishy-washy. I've had a lot of great experience with it. I've had clients who have had a lot of great experience with it. It is going to help metabolize caffeine. Now you don't want to get dependent on it is, is one of the big things because I, I've found that clients who have just chronically taken too much caffeine later into the evening and then have grown a dependency on the root of carp and have a trouble um, sleeping without it, if you will. Now, that being said, again, anecdotal, not research uh, specific. I'm more so just speaking from experience and what I've seen within my own clients, but rutacarpin can be something useful to have on hand, um, especially for those scenarios where you're just having to have more caffeine because of the circumstances, um, like coming back to the nurses where you're shifting from day shift to night shift, and that may be in the same day type situation. It's just a very unfortunate scheduling conflict, but you probably have to consume more caffeine in that setting because of the scenario. And so utilizing it in that setting could be useful. Yes. And within rutacarpine, uh, Legion does have a supplement in that has it called Lunar. It is a chamomile flavor. So if you like chamomile tea, you will love it. Um, But you can use code Sue on that Legion product. So for those supplements, the ones that are the same for me every night are going to be Cordy's, Magnesium, and then Theanine. Um, And those, well, I guess THC as well is going to fit in there. Um, And it's going to be really helpful. Now, some things out of those seven categories that we talked about that didn't really fit into each one that I wanted to mention, um, first is going to be a brain dump. So 
We've mentioned of how we struggle when it comes to anxiety and navigating through that and just there's a lot going on in the world. There's a lot going on inside of our heads. And so something that we implement within clients is doing a brain dump. And what a brain dump is, is basically just dumping what all's on your brain. So having a pen and paper by your bedside, you can do it on your phone and in your notes app, but in the spirit of staying away from screens, as well as just being able to connect to what you're doing, being able to just have that pen and paper. And before you go to bed or as you're winding down, just dumping out everything that's on your mind, whether it's nonsensical, whether it's a grocery list or to-do list of things you need to remember the next day, different thoughts that pop into your mind, Mind, a song that's stuck in your head, being able to write that down and get it out of your head can be so extremely helpful when it comes to being able to have quality nights of sleep. Um, then we already mentioned showers, but they're also going to be really great if you have allergies. And this is something that we noticed, especially in the spring, fall time of dealing with really bad allergies and not feeling good. But as soon as we washed them all off, made sure we weren't bringing them into the bed regularly, then that helped our sleep a ton. And especially Alex, he has a lot worse allergies than myself. And it was just so much being gunked up. And if we are both getting into the bed without showering before bed, then that was causing some issues within not only the sheets being dirty, but so much dander all over the place, causing our sleep not to be in the best spot. Um, and then alcohol is something I wanted to mention because alcohol near bed, just matter of fact, it's going to greatly disrupt your sleep. I know that there are some people who feel like alcohol helps them sleep or maybe lulls them to sleep, whether they have a certain amount or just having a glass before bed. But when we really look at the effects of alcohol and what that does to you, it is going to break up your sleep and it's not going to be the best right before bed. And so being able to make sure that you space that out just like we talked about within food of not eating really close to bed um, because that's not only going to affect your digestion of your body still trying to digest that food and then you go and you lay horizontal and also when you sleep your digestion is down regulated because you only have certain processes going while you sleep then you are trying to digest the food then the food ends up sitting in you you can't sleep you're not digesting your food you wake up and things don't feel good so eating too close to to bed and again training too close to bed or being stimulated too close to bed can be really difficult and same with having alcohol too close to bed so spacing that out two to three hours before bed can be really helpful thc is going to be similar as well like yeah. you're not going to be able to smoke right before bed and fall right asleep and have qual it's going to have disruption as well so you have to be we're not i feel as though this podcast has turned into a, a little bit of too strong of positive on thc there are <laughs> negatives to it. Um, and that's going to be part of, so you have to be cognizant of that as well. Yeah. And then if you are waking up throughout the night, we're not going to talk too specifically on this, but there are going to be time-specific considerations to keep in mind, depending on if you, again, are having a hard time falling asleep, if you're waking up within a few hours of going to sleep, and that's normally due to glucose regulation. Um, if you are waking up within like three to four hours after you go to sleep or five to six hours, there's going to be different considerations to keep in mind, whether that comes from overtraining or not having the proper food in place or the meal you eat right before bed or anything like that, there's going to be an impact. So knowing, again, keeping consistent, what time am I going to bed? What time am I waking up is going to be great data for you to be able to realize what that looks like. But it is going to be natural to wake up to go to the bathroom throughout the night. Um, but any way that you can space water out from bed. So we try to finish the bulk of our water earlier in the evening. So we're not drinking a ton right before bed because I can last throughout the night without peeing um, as long as I'm not drinking right before I go to bed. Yeah, I, th I think that to clarify on that, it's, it's more of the major bolus of your water consumption being concluded probably two or three hours before you're going to bed. It's still okay to like sip yeah, water yeah. in those different aspects. I think that some people get a little bit uh, crazy with that. Like you're still, like if you are needing a drink of water, you're feeling like you're parched, like just have a sip of water and be good. Yes. And then the last thing I want to note, um, unless Alex has something else, is sleep apnea. And this is something that you might be very hesitant to admit that you have or looking into it further because you don't want to use the whole sleep apnea machine or you don't think that your snoring is the reason or 
um, the snoring is because you have sleep apnea. But I will just say that you are like literally stopping breathing in your sleep if you have sleep apnea. Not only are you disturbing the people that you might sleep with, um, but also very much so disturbing your quality of sleep and your quality of life um, by not having that machine in place. So I would highly recommend if you are someone who is a heavy snorer or you fit the bill for a lot of the other aspects for sleep apnea to go and get that checked out to talk to your doctor and to wear the CPAP machine, even if it feels like it's really annoying and not sexy at all, because retainers aren't sexy either. And we still make those happen. And the other thing with sleep apnea is that the sleep studies don't have to be, you know, they can be at home now. So that's the, the beautiful thing. And I think that that's a lot of why people don't do it one, because they don't want to wear the CPAP uh, machine, but also having to go into somewhere and have the sleep study conducted to see where they're at. They can, your doctor can send home all the things that's like a home kit. You're able to do it on your, in your own bed. It's, it's much more accurate because you're not having to go to basically a hotel and, and sleep in a different environment and your sleep's already going to be disrupted that way. So the sleep study can be done at home and that's much more comfortable. Um, and it will be a tremendous help if that's something that you're experiencing. Yeah. So that is the greatest performance enhancing drug that you are not prioritizing is your sleep. And those are seven factors or aspects that are going to help within your sleep. I will say within this, don't try to implement all these things at once. Take one of these. If you're someone who is really struggling with your sleep, um, or you're someone who's just wanting to see if you can get 1% better of sleep, take one of these things, apply it, have some time with it, play with it in your schedule, change it and kind of move it around to see what's best and then implement the next thing. Don't try to go through and be like, all right, Sue and Alex said to do all seven of these things. I'm implementing them today because I've been that person before. Mm -hmm. And then you're beating yourself up for not being able to all of a sudden overhaul your entire routine and having this like perfectly by research backed, uh, the schedule of things to make it perfect. It's like, just pick a couple, use them, implement a couple more. There's going to be things within this that work really, really well for you. And there may be some things in this list or things that we recommended that don't work much at all for you. And that's okay. You've just got to find things that are going to positively enhance your sleep and, and that will be best for you. Yeah. And really think about being intentional, not perfect. That's something that's helped me, a recovering um, perfectionist of just thinking of you can't be perfect and that shouldn't deter you from doing something. Um, but it should be able to give you some awareness of if things aren't perfect, things can't be perfect. And so being intentional about what you do is a lot more in your control and doable. And so really uh, looking at these factors, taking intention towards your sleep and realizing it's it's never going to be perfect. We still, as people who care deeply about our sleep and prioritize it deeply and sometimes get called fuddy-duddies for going to sleep as early as we do, like we love sleep, we care about sleep, and our sleep is still not perfect. And so just being able to be intentional about the things that you do, recognizing the aspects it affects, and also being able to prioritize it yourself and know what you want out of your life and your quality of sleep. Um, and hopefully you're able to share this podcast with someone that you know that is struggling with sleep or just might need to prioritize their sleep a little bit more. Um, and we would love if you could share that on with someone in your life that you think would benefit from this podcast. And of course, we always love being able to hear from you guys, whether it's your thoughts or things that you specifically do based on a topic, and this one being sleep, that is really helpful because we love to comment back or to share um, things that you guys share with us that is really helpful. So if you're watching this on YouTube, leave us a comment. If you are listening to this on a podcast platform, we would absolutely love if you could leave us a review. Um, and if you do have have comments and you're not on YouTube, then slide into our DMs or there's going to be a link in the show notes that you can go ahead and submit either a topic or a question or a comment. And we'd absolutely love to hear from you. But hopefully you are able to realize that sleep is for the elite. And hopefully you're feeling a little bit more elite um, here in this next week.